So in a few weeks' time, we're going to be starting this purpose-driven purpose life. Um, I know a number of you got the books, a number of you are getting the books, and we've still got a few weeks yet. But I, I'm just doing a few run-ins into it, so we know where we are once we start, because there's no point just starting on one day and saying, right, let's rock it from here. And uh, when I've been thinking about purpose-driven, it came to me about, or as I've been thinking about, what drives you? What drives me? What, what is it that gets, gets you out of bed in the morning? What is it that really t gets you going? Paul says this, he says, don't get me wrong friends, <laughs> by no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I have got my eyes on the goal where God is beckoning me forwards towards Jesus. So a question for us tonight is what drives you? What gets you going? What stops you? Because sometimes it's not always a case of, you know, you can have a, something that drives you, but sometimes things can be put brakes on. Many people have different things that drive them. I'm going to go through a few, uh, a few of them. But some people, I'm going to be careful, but most of us men would have remembered our teenage years and those certain emotions and certain feelings that drove us. Some of us have grown out of them. Some of them haven't. Yes. But sometimes things internally can drive us. Some external things can drive us. Some people leave home, not because they want to leave home, but they're driven out. Some people set goals in their life because of a, a, a spouse or a parent. But many people have to, are driven by different things. And one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, is why, why are we here? Not why are we in Stormy Bridge, but why do we exist? Why are we here? Why isn't it that when we get saved, that God just doesn't leave us here for another year to sort things out and take us home? Why, why am I here? Why are you here? And then, when considering that, what drives us forward while we're here? The word drive actually means to guide, to control, to direct. You drive a car. It always makes me laugh when you get in with a car with some people and you're driving and they are using the brake that isn't there. Yeah. You, you've gone alongside people and they're putting the foot down. You, if you hit it any hard, it's going to go through a floor. Or people try grabbing the handbrake. Get your hands off there. I remember when I used to take my driving lessons, um, broadly to a friend who took me out. And the first thing he told me is how to uh, over, drop down to third gear and overtake. Because he said, this is boring, waiting behind cars when you learn to get moving. But what drives you will actually steer you through the rest of your life. What, what drives you will get you out of bed in the morning. What drives you will keep you in a dark place if that's where you want to be. It's what drives you. So, point one, if you're taking notes, many people are driven by guilt. Guilt of something. Um, many people are driven by the fact they feel guilty, shame, they've got regrets. Their whole life is controlled and run by the guilt of something and shame of something in the past. Allowing the past to control their future. Some people do something and what they did controls everything from that point onwards. We heard this morning that really we need to break free from these things and live a guilt-free life according to Romans 8 verse 1. If you read in Genesis 4, 12, it says this, that from now on you will be homeless, wanderer on the earth. It's an account of when Cain killed his brother. And God came to him and says, because of what you've done, you're going to be a wanderer. <coughs> but guilt there, but shame there. And he went off. Many people are like aimless wanderers, a prisoner to their guilt. Something's happened to them and they're not going anywhere. They just exist in life without any specific aim in life. But God's a specialist in the second chance. You know that, don't you? God's an expert at giving us another opportunity. Psalms 32 says this, verse 1. Oh, what the joy of those who, who dis whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. You can read a similar version of that of Romans 4. But how, what great joy for us. 
For any of us, we've all disobeyed God. And therefore, we are guilty and, and we can feel shame for that. But when we come before God in repentance, it's forgiven. It's gone. It's pushed away. In fact, he said, I forget your sins. I forget the these things. And sometimes we're living with the guilt of something in the past. And we come back to God again and again and say to him, but God, I'm sorry for this. And he goes, for what? And he said, for this. And he's going, I've forgotten it. So that means the only person who's got the problem with what you did in the past, other than the consequences of that action, is you. Because God's going, I've forgiven, it's forgotten, move on. I don't think I make a great counsellor. <coughs> I'll admit to it, I don't think I'm a great counsellor because I really want to deal with three things when I'm counselling people, talking things through problems. Number one, admit you've done it wrong. Number two, deal with it. Number three, get over it. Now get out of here. I mean, to me, is that, is that too simplistic? Yeah. But I feel guilty. Well, how can you feel guilty of something you've been forgiven of? Yes, if it hurts people and there's all that sort of stuff you've got to work through. But in God, you've got to consider many people on this earth are driven by guilt or something in the past. Other people are driven by resentment or even anger. Some people hold on to pains and hurts that there's been done to them. They often cl um, clam up or blow up. People who hold on to pain and hurts, when you talk to them about certain things can sometimes shut down or do the opposite, they blow up. We were never designed to carry things from the past. We were never created by God to carry a wheelbarrow of what's been done to us or hurts and pains. We were called by God to keep walking forward. And yet many people's lives are shut down because they're carrying things they were never designed to carry. Guys, if you think you're the only one who's ever been hurt, it's a lie. Everybody's been hurt. Everybody's been hurt in some way or form. But it's up to you and it's up to me whether I carry that pain and that hurts. It's up to us. I don't want anything in my past to have cut to hold me back from my future. And yet hurts and pains will. Job 5 verse 2 says this, Surely resentment destroys a fool. And jealousy kills a simple. If you've got resentment, it can destroy you. If you're jealous of things, it will kill you. We need to leave it behind. You might not be able to have controlled what somebody did to you, but you can control how it moves forward. With Jesus, the communion table for me is a place where I can bring them hurts, those pains, and lay them at the cross. Our problem often is that we, we bring them to Jesus, but we've got them attached to us, so we walk away and we zip them back to us. Because sometimes our hurts and our pains help us to feel something. It's not good but it gives us a reason. Some people are driven by resentment and anger. Some people are driven by guilt. Many people are driven by fear. I don't know if any of you guys are, are driven by fear, but some people are driven by fear. Fear of failure, so they don't do something. Fear of success, so they don't do something. Fear of a parent. Why is it sometimes, even now, I'll do something and I can hear my dad's voice in my head from stuff when I was little? Why? Because it's in there. And even I heard a testimony of somebody whose parent had been dead for years who still controlled their life. Because all they could ever hear is, you're no good. Nothing good will come of you. And they were driven by fear. Fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming the person God intended you to be. People fear commitment. People fear loneliness. People fear all sorts of different things. 
I was talking to somebody who, you think, well, who would fear, who would fear success? <coughs> I know people who have, have jeopardized their own life because they were being successful. Because they were told that people from their family would never succeed. And when they did, people started to go, oh, you think you're better than us? Fear crept in. People got prayed for this morning. And um, people were healed this morning. But the interesting is people are fearful of getting healed. Because sickness gives some people a purpose. It gives them an identity, yeah. It gives them a reason. Yeah, that's not God's plan. 1 John 4, 18 says this, For there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves tor uh, torment. But he who, is, who fears has not been made perfect in love. If we've got fears in our life, we can give them to Jesus because his perfect love casts out all fears. Why can some people go to a point in their life where they die for the gospel without fear? It's because they've got their eyes on Jesus. Jesus is the number one in their life. If we've got fears, then we're thinking too much of other people. I remember a guy once says to me when I was first, started, first started preaching. And he says, first of all, Johnny, if you stand up there and fear, you've got too much self-confidence and you think too much of yourself. I went, right, okay. He says, but if you're not nervous, then you're not trusting in God. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, there needs to be an element of trusting in God, but not caring what people think. Because the day you care what people think, fear can come in, and fear will grip you, and fear will destroy you. The message version says this, There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, and, and fear, uh, crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. When you give your life over to God, you're giving it over into somebody's hands who cares and loves you. And all we've got to do is trust Him. Some people are driven by materialism, driven by getting all the things. Things become their goals. I heard a, a song recently, and I really like it, and I'm going to play it one, one time for people. But it says this, I want, I want, I don't want the healing, I want the healer. And in context, not saying it's wrong to be healed. They do want the healing, but they want the healer more. They don't want, the, they don't want saving, they want the saviour. They, the, they don't want deliverance, they want the deliverer. When sometimes people become Christians, and just because they want to get out of hell. And I must admit, that's why I became a Christian. When I first became a Christian, it wasn't about peace and joy and living a good life and a ministry maybe and great things God's got for me. Somebody told me about hell and I thought, I don't want to go there. It's pretty honest. But then as I've grown in God, I've realised that God's got so much more for us. And the God that I'm serving, Jesus Christ, He wants me to have a relationship with Him. In fact, it's not about getting out of hell, it's about spending eternity with him. Yeah. And that's what it's become. And some people become Christians because of God's stuff. Become a Christian and you can have his stuff. Become a Christian and you can get healed. Become a Christian and you can prosper. Become a, Christ a Christian and you can deliver you from that drug addiction. Become a Christian and you can do it, which are all true. <coughs> but Jesus didn't die on a cross just so that we could have his stuff. He died on a cross so he could have a relationship with us. Now I know, I married Jo for her stuff, but she came along with it. I was like, I got that wrong mixed up, didn't I? Yeah, I married Jo. <laughs> now some people come to God for the stuff, and yet God says, my stuff, get, no, forget the stuff, get him, and then you get the stuff anyway. What that stuff might be. You know, Having stuff, if that's what's driving you forward, <coughs> then you need a dose of generosity from God and a giving heart. Because materialism will hold you on the fear of, of not having stuff, will drive you to grab, to go for it. Yet if you've got a generous heart, you'll sow seeds and you'll always reap. 
and it, it's a perpetual thing. I remember a millionaire once being interviewed, and the interview is famous thing says, how many more millions do you need before you feel secure? And he said, one more. There's always one more million to get. One more. Well, in Jesus, we don't need one more anything. We've got it all in him. And we can be secure in him. 1 Timothy 6, 10 says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, and their greediness has pierced them with, through with many sorrows. There's nothing wrong with having money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And when you grab and, gr and, and you greed it, it will lead you into many places of sorrow. Real security can only be found in Jesus. Materialism, if that's what drives you, you need to put that straight with God. If guilt is what's driving you, then you need to bring it to Jesus. If resentment and anger is, is there, again, take it to Jesus. If fear is driving you, you need to take it to Jesus. Another reason why people are driven is sometimes by approval. This is awful. That some people, all they look for is to be approved by somebody else. I got past it years ago. Because sometimes I used to imagine preaching. No, I used to imagine when I was preaching, that people were holding cards up. And I would always get <coughs> six. It'd all be six. Six, 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 six. It wouldn't be 5.9. It'd be six. Now, I don't know if um, people were thinking about it. I'm not, but I thought that. Not because I thought I was pre <laughs> preaching good. Because I wasn't preaching for people's approval, and yet so many people do. Some people live their lives for their parents' approval, their spouse's approval, friends or peers. Some people are driven by what their spouse says more than what God says. Some people are about what a parent says more than what God says. Some adults are still trying to earn the approval of the parents, even though their parents might not even be here. Because they're in such a tract of mind. <coughs> I put down here I don't know everything in life but I know you can't please everyone you're never going to get the approval of everybody some people genuinely or genuinely will not like you you can be the best person going but they might not like you now I don't understand that about me but it's true some people don't like me but I can't live my life on people who don't like me I can live my life on the one who died for me. And when I've got him in place, everything else just falls into place. Now, I'm not going to be obnoxious and awful to people, but I need to just trust God. Matthew, uh, and Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. In the context, it goes into other things. But I look at that and think, you can either, you can either go for the approval of God or the approval of somebody else. And I want God's approval. You see, when I get to heaven, it'd be great to see you guys there clapping and waving. But I won't be listening for you guys going, well done. I'll be listening for one voice who will say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the voice I'm looking for. He's the one I'm looking for approval from. And if you're living your life looking for the approval of others, then it's going to be you know, a lonely life, a devastating life, because you might <coughs> never get their approval. We need a life that's a life, living a Jesus-driven life. Not driven by anything else. A Jesus-driven life. Amen. Knowing why you are here, why you exist, why you're part of this community, why you're in the body of Christ right here, will give you meaning in life. It'll give you a purpose. All these other things will just slow you down in India. But having a Jesus-driven life, knowing why you're here, will give your life meaning. There's nothing worse than getting to the end of life wondering what it was all about. Why were I here? In Isaiah 49, 4, it says this, Then I said, I have laboured in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, and it is in vain. Job 7, verse 6 says, My days are fleeting faster than a weaver's shuttle. Job 7, 16 says this, I hate my life, I do not... I do not want to live forever. Leave me alone because my days are so brief. Death is not the saddest thing that can happen to somebody. Death is not the saddest thing that can happen to somebody. The saddest thing is somebody living a life without meaning. 
living your life without a purpose and a meaning is like a sailing ship with its sails down. It's got the capability and the potential to void oceans and it's sat in an arbour because it has no purpose. It's like these new phones you can buy. I don't have an iPhone, but we'll take the iPhone for example. Or it could be a Nokia, or it could be a Samsung just for advertising purposes. It could be any phone. I buy a phone so I can ring people. Ding, ding, ding. Hello, Philip. How are you? We chat. I hang up. Now and then I text. Ooh. Rarely. Rarely. <laughs> Joe sends me a paragraph. Okay. Text back. <laughs> there we are. So that no. But, you know, that's not the full potential of the phone. These new phones. You can email. You can Facebook. You can Bible on it. You can track on it. You can actually run your life on your phone. I've got a Fitbit. Ooh. I keep checking my hand. Get those steps up. Don't know if that works, but I'll find out. I had eight hours sleep last night and only 20 minutes disturbed and restless. That's what it says. But on your phone, you can live your life. Yet there's so much more on a phone than any of us ever use. But I buy a phone to ring people. Your life, your life was built with great purpose, with a great destiny and a plan. And yet often you like these new phones and you're in my hand where I ring somebody up. And yet there's so much more you can do. So much purpose you've got. Your life is not a waste. Your life might be fleeting. And I'll tell you this, at the end of your life, I would hate any of you to get there and go, why have I been here? It's been but a waste of time. God wants us to live a life of purpose. Jeremiah 11, 29, a verse that you're all very familiar with. I know the plans are for you, says the Lord. They are plans to, for good and not disaster, to give you a future and hope. You've got a purpose. I live on that verse because I know God's got a future for me, a purpose for me. I am not here to exist and just get by. You're not here to exist and get by. You're here for a purpose. In Ephesians 3.20 it says, Now unto God who is able to do through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinity more than we might ask or think. I like that. Because I like to think. And if God can do more than I think, I've got a big imagination. Yeah, he can do more. He can, some people don't believe God can do anything for them, yet he can do so much. And yet other people are living in this, this, this zone where God just seems to bless them so much. God wants you to live an awesome life, a life of meaning. Knowing why you're here will actually simplify your life. Knowing why you are here will simplify your life. If you know that God's call on your life is to be a missionary, then you don't need to go and get a degree in some silly subject. Now, not wrong, but if you know that your call is to go one way, then it narrows down where you've got to go. When you know what God's got for you, you can head towards it. I grew up wanting to be a soldier. Sometimes people be saying, they say, what do you want to do? They'll go, don't know. By the age of six, I knew exactly what, what I wanted to do. And by the age of 16, I was very determined to do what I knew I wanted to do. That was my call in life, I thought. I looked at the idea of being a teacher. And I thought, forget it, I'll just go into being a soldier. That's all I ever wanted to be. But then I got saved. And God changed me and changed my life and gave me a new purpose. And as soon as he gave me a new purpose, I stopped trying to become a soldier. But if I'd have carried on trying to be a soldier, then my purpose would never have been fulfilled. Yet God had a plan for me. In Proverbs 13, 7, it says this, There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet gets made great riches. God just says if we trust in him, it's not about what we can do. It's about trusting in him. It's about just putting ourselves in God's hands. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust you and those thoughts who are fixing you. 
That's another verse I love. I talk to you guys about peace, having peace on the inside. And if you've got peace on the inside, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. And this said, Isaiah 26 verse 3, you, let's talk about God, will keep in perfect peace all who trust you. So if I trust in him, I'll have perfect peace. So if you trust in him, you'll have perfect peace. And then you don't need to come to me for counselling when I'll tell you to get over it and get out. Because you'll already be in perfect peace. You're not tracking with me on this one, are you? You're thinking I'm definitely not good. You still can't get over the fact that I've got a pastor who will be no good at counselling. I'm not that bad. But if I trust in God, he will keep me in perfect peace. He will keep me in perfect peace. And those whose thoughts are fixed on you. So if I keep my mind fixed on Jesus, I'll have perfect peace. So storms are raging, and I can have perfect peace. Sometimes, I'm not saying I love storms, but when I go into them, I'm one of these people, in the literal sense, in a storm, I want to be right at the front. I've been on ferries, in storms, and I've been right at the front, looking over, going, come on! (laughs) Just because that's where my heart is. I've been in planes and bouncing around, and I'm loving it. Everyone's just clinging on for their lives. Because when you've got peace, and you know why you're here, I know God's not finished with me. I might surprise you, but therefore I know I've still got some time. God's not finished with me, and God's got a plan for me and a purpose. But knowing why you're here simplifies your life. Knowing why you're here gives you focus. Gives you focus. If your purpose one Saturday, you're out with me walking, and our purpose is to go up an hill, pen again, that gives you purpose. There's no point walking towards Ingleborough when we're going up pen again. There's no point walking towards Wernside if we're going up pen again. You need focus. And yet many believers don't know why they're here, so they're running here, running there, running up here, running down there. I said to somebody recently, you need to stop running around like an endless chicken and get before God and spend six months praying, find out what God's purpose for you is, and then go do that. And they said to me, no, and get running around, get on with it. But God's got a plan of purpose for us, so knowing why you gives you focus, Ephesians 5, 17 says, don't live careless, unthinking, uh, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Philippians 3.13 No, dear brothers and sisters, I have, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past. I look forward to what lies ahead. If Paul said he's not achieved everything, but what he does do is forget I mean, guys, if some of you could get hold of that verse, Philippians 3.13, if you could get hold of that one, it could radically change your life. I have not achieved it, but one thing I do, forget, forgetting what is behind, and I look forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what's happened, forgetting the hurt, Forgetting the problems and focusing forwards. Message version says this. Friends, do not get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this. But one thing I do, I keep my eye on the goal where God has beckoned me forward towards Jesus. Philippians 3, 15 and 16 says, So let's keep focused on the goal who's, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clearly will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Sorry, that's a different version of the Bible. But I like it because it says, you know, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision so you can see it. Focus. Focus is what we need. When we do this fast today thing, focus will do what you need, especially when you get into you know, week three and four, you need to keep focused. 
When boxers go into the ring, one thing their managers always say is keep focused. Remember your training, keep focused. I was watching a, a silly program, of, well, not silly program, a documentary about somebody who was good at baseball. And uh, he often teaches people about baseball. And the analogy is the same in golf, if you're into golf. But most people, when they, when they get it wrong, it's because they take their eye off the ball. When the ball's thrown and they swing the bat, they've got to watch the ball, not the bat. They need to be focused on the ball, not where it's going. They need to be focused on the ball, not where they stood. And in golf, I don't play golf, I hate golf. It's just, it's, a, it's annoying sport. But you've got to keep your eye on the ball. If you're not focused on the ball, you're not going to get, get it anywhere. And in our lives, we need to remember, we need focused lives, focused on Jesus and on his purpose. Knowing why you're here will motivate your lives. Sometimes I wonder, but I reckon, if I'd have known some of you guys in your teenage years, when you first saw your spouse or you first in the chase, you'd have been very focused. No one else stopping you. I remember having a girlfriend years ago and she said, I'm off to a prayer meeting, John's come. Yeah. It was the worst prayer meeting I've ever gone to. It didn't last long anyway with her, but it was a good thing. It was worth that. I didn't mind going to the prayer meeting with her, as long as she was there. It was, you, know, you were focused, I'm focused on her. And then it kind of, but it gives you more, it gives you, uh, if you know why you're here, it motivates your life. Why is it it takes a doctor to tell you you're going to die before some people change their diets? Because it gives them motivation. Why is it the boss says, I might need to lay somebody off, that gives somebody motivation to make sure they turn up on time? Because we need motivation, but God can give us motivation. Knowing why you're here will prepare you for heaven. I believe that what we do down here is like an investment into what we'll be when we get there. I believe that the Bible teaches that when we get to heaven, we'll be rewarded. But it does say that some people will get to heaven just by the skin of the teeth. They'll have no rewards, they'll just get there. Others will have great rewards. And it's all to do with what we do down here. This is an adoption that's been brought in by the church to make people work. This is a Bible teaching session that says that you know if you're doing things for good and for God down here you're doing God's purpose in your life and you're honoring God then you'll be richly rewarded when you get there now most people we are told and rightfully so that if you don't invest in a pension when you're working when you retire you'll have nothing it'd be foolishness not to invest but yet many people are not prepared in their lives by focusing on Jesus here well investing in the future I might have to teach them that sometime. Well, the Bible says this, that every man's works, whether good or bad, will be tested by fire. The word there, bad, is a bad translation. It doesn't mean it's an evil work, it just means it was a self-righteous work. That's all. Every man's work, well down on earth, will be put before God and it will be tested by fire. And it talks about gold and silver and precious stones, and they survive fire. But then it talks about wood, hay, and stubble, which are burnt up. And it says that that person will have loss. So even in heaven, there's going to be people there who feel loss. Not being lost, they're not kicked out of them, they're not thrown into hell or anything like that. But their life and their purpose when they get to heaven They'll think everything's hunky dory and alright because they did so much in their own strength. So when they get there, everything has got to be burnt up. You can read this in Corinthians. But for us, we have a purpose driven life, a life focused on Jesus. And therefore, by doing what God's called us to do down here, we store up rewards up there. Now, the rewards up there are not our focus, our focus is Jesus down here. But the result of Jesus down here means we get results up there. Yeah. It's a bizarre thing. It's like you might not be looking for a healing, but you go after the healer and you get the healing. 
You know, you might be not be looking for salvation in all its fullness, but you go after the Saviour and you get the saving. You get everything by going after Jesus. You don't, you know, you go after Jesus just for him, you get his stuff, but if you go after his stuff, you don't get him. And that's what it's about. We go after Jesus right down here, right on earth, and we get rewarded here and there. But we're not doing it to get rewarded here and there. We're doing it for him. And that's a purpose-driven life. A life focused on Jesus. You know, it says in Hebrews 12, we need to keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In us, the author and perfecter. Every one of us has a great opportunity in Jesus. Every one of us has a great um, purpose in Jesus. And yet I've seen people really on fire Christians throw away their purpose because one lady I knew, she threw away her purpose because she didn't want to spend the rest of her life alone. So she, died, she started dating a non-Christian before long they'd moved in together and then that was messing up and he, he was already ill with cancer and he died, he wasn't a believer and died. And now in a sense, I never got married, but now she's in regret and remorse for what she did, but she can't get over it. There's other people who's messed up life because they didn't want something or were feeling controlling people. Guys, I'll say this, I don't know if it's somebody here. But some of you, someone has been manipulated by somebody else so that they cannot fulfill their God-given purpose. Now, it's nothing wrong with helping somebody. There's nothing wrong with assisting. But if somebody's manipulating you into constantly being there for them, helping them so that you cannot give full attention to your own life, then that person is probably not a godly person, even if they call themselves a Christian. So God's got a purpose for every one of us. A purpose. So what drives you? Basically, if it's anything other than Jesus... Jesus seems to be answered to everything, doesn't it? It's the old Sunday school story thing. But if, if it's anything other than Jesus number one, spouse number two, family number three, your call and mis- um, ministry number four, if it's not Jesus first, it's going to go off the tracks a little bit. Go after Jesus with all your hearts. Have a purpose driven. And don't let things pass you by. Don't procrastinate on things. Don't think I'll do it whenever. Start. Because life's too short to wonder, well, I might do it next year. Some of you guys got the call of God in your life and you keep putting off because it's not the right circumstances now. But it'll never be the right circumstances because a step of faith is outside circumstances. Sometimes you've got to just jump and go for it. So let me encourage every one of us. If you're still alive and you're still breathing, God's got a purpose for you. A plan for you. A destiny for you. And I don't want to be the one that kicks you the backside. I pray the Holy Spirit does. But if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, maybe somebody else might come alongside you and kick you up the backside. Come on! Be it everything that you've been called to be. And if you don't know what it is, spend this, this time going through Purpose Driven Life, the book and this, what we're doing in the church. Spend that time before God saying, what's my purpose, God? What's my destiny? Which is a risk, because somebody's hinted at me that they, they believe God's calling them to another country, to a Bible college. And I'm saying, yeah, there's only Jewsbury. Same one, but in Dewsbury. But they feel it's in another country. But if they go, they go. If that's what God's purpose is for them, we'll pray them and send them. But what's your purpose? It's risky. Because I should be saying, oh, you should stick here with me. But I want your purpose to be what God's called it to be. And if that means you fly and soar like an eagle, go beyond everything else, Let's encourage you and let's go for it. And let's do it together, amen.